إليك أنت صباحي مصفد بمسايا فاسكب ضياءك إني ضمآن ضل صدايا إليك أنت صباحي مصفد بمسايا فاسكب ضياءك إني ضمآن ضل صدايا لم أدر من أين بعد أسقي جنين الركايا والشط لا ما فيه يطفي اللغى في حجايا رحماك يا ربي إني وزورقي والخطايا في لجة ليس فيها من الضياء بقايا جفت وغاضت ولكن ما زلت أزجي رجايا يا 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 رجائي يا رجائي يا رجائي يا رجائي My name is uh, Art Blodgett. I live in Batavia, Illinois. And the event today about uh, Sisters of Islam I thought was excellent for myself. I'm a Christian and I didn't, it enlightened me on a lot of questions I had about Islam and the principles of Islam and uh, the misconceptions of Islam. Uh, some of the misconceptions are, in my opinion, are portrayed a lot by the media, and it's always uh, the bad misconceptions, and I believe I, I uh, put a lot of those misconceptions to rest today, which I, I knew were incorrect in the first place, because the, anything that typically comes out in the media are the, the bad issues concerning Islam. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panel today for answering my questions, uh, thank the doctor for uh, his speech, and I thought it was very informative, and I really enjoyed it, and if there's a second session, I want to come back for that session also. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm the Deputy Director at the Aurora Public Library. I so appreciated this program today. I loved what the sisters had to say. So smart, so thoughtful. Um, the whole presentation was really great. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you again. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Diane Blodgett and I'm from Batavia. Um, and what I think about the program. I was, I was really excited when I saw this um, advertised on Facebook. And so I just saw it like yesterday and I'm thinking, oh, I want to go. So I signed up and then I told my husband to come with me. Um, I thought it was very, very enlightening. I especially enjoyed listening to the women talk because if we're talking about women in Islam, it, I want to hear the women's voices, um, and I think that, that this kind of a program and many other programs where people are allowed to come and talk and exchange ideas is so helpful for humanity, um, but I especially liked learning about Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulil kareem. What I just recited was, I begin with the name of Allah. All praises belong to Allah alone. And salutations be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Good afternoon everyone and welcome 
to a special interfaith program organized by Gain Peace. And this is in collaboration with the Centuri Public Library. And our topic of discussion and presentation for today is Women in Islam. My name is, I hope you can see the screen, my name is Nurul Sayed, and I'm going to be the master of conduct for today's program. And I'm also the cameraman, so please forgive me if you see me running around here and there. And uh, before I begin, I just want to mention that we video record our sessions for educational purpose. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said, he who does not thank people has not thanked Allah. So before I begin our session, I want to thank each and every one of you who came out today on a beautiful Sunday afternoon, which you could have spent with your family and friends, but you choose to come here to learn and discuss about a very important topic relating to Islam and Muslims. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for coming today. And I also want to thank uh, the Aurora Centuri Public Library and Michaela, she's in the back, for allowing us to conduct this session, uh, being so graceful and respectful and uh, embracing us with a lot of dignity and respect. So thank you so much, Michaela. I actually bugged her for one month and she was so <laughs> welcoming that everything I throw it at her, she said yes to that. Thank you so much, Michaela. <laughs> for the first time, we are having a banners outside for the women in Islam. If you get a chance, before you leave, you can actually have a look at those banners outside. Okay, so some of the housekeeping, before I begin uh, our session, housekeeping rules followed by the agenda and some of the ethical rules and the moral rules for today's session. In terms of the housekeeping rules, everyone is requested to sign in the sign-in sheet. My friend, Brother Rashid, is having the sign-in sheet and also name tags. If you can get a name tag for yourself, he's going to be coming around to you so that uh, you can sign in and also get a name tag for yourself. And um, uh, the restrooms are right outside the conference room, it's right behind us. You can actually walk out, make a right, make a right and then it should be on the right-hand side. Uh, we have some snacks for all of you, although we are fasting, but uh, you know, we, are, we, want you to, we want you to have snacks and be comfortable here. We will not be offended by anything. <laughs> we are used to, we are trained to fast, you know, even though if somebody is eating in front of us, we are not, not at all bothered about it because we have been trained so, so many years for the fasting. So please help yourself. Uh, we have some snacks in the back. And also we have some uh, booth in the back for Islamic literature. This is absolutely free. It has some important information regarding jihad in Islam, women's right in Islam, who is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in Islam, who is Prophet Muhammad, and uh, some of the misconceptions that are related to Islam. And the most important thing that this booth contains is the English translation of the Holy Quran. And I would request all of you to take, take that with you. And if, so, if you know somebody who would be interested to have this information, I would request you to take another bag for them, actually. So this is absolutely free for you all. All right. So that was the housekeeping rules. And then we have the agenda for today. So in terms of, I think we, I think I'm missing one name over there. So uh, in terms of the agenda, we will have the, our session on the topic of women in Islam by our main speaker, uh, Dr. Sabil Ahmed. And that will be follow, followed by the Q&A session for the remainder of the time, which will be conducted by our three sisters, women panelists. So uh, we intend to finish our presentation by 3 p.m. And right after that, actually, I'm going to introduce our women panelists. And then we will uh, conclude that till 4.30 p.m. at the max. And right after that, I would request some of our guests, the, our brothers and sisters from other faiths, to give us some video testimonials about the program or how they felt. Your feedback is very important to us. It helps us improve, us, uh, improve in the future as well. So that is the agenda for today. And now comes to the ethical and the moral rules for today. And it is a very humble request from our team here at Gain Peace that uh, if you, when our speaker is speaking and if you disagree with him on a certain matter, on a certain topic or a statement that he made, we request you to hold back your thoughts and uh, we will get your clarification in the Q&A session. Make a note of your question and uh, we will get that clarified in the Q&A session. What happens is when somebody uh, asks in the middle of the presentation, the people who are trying to concentrate might lose the track of what they were actually trying to focus on. And also the, the speaker might also lose track. Actually, I did that just now, right? Uh -huh. 
<clears throat> okay, so that's that. And also if the speaker uses any Arabic in his language, please do not be intimidated. He's going to make sure that he's going to translate that for you to understand. All right, so, so let us begin now. So we have this topic of women in Islam. It is a very delicate and a hostile situation out there for all the Muslims living around the world. Racial slurs, discrimination, hate crimes, executive orders, bigotry, judgment based on appearance, uh, bullying, intolerance, violence, oppression, subjugation, and any kind of evil that you can think of, wars and injustice, is currently happening with the Muslims living around the world. And our brave Muslim sisters are actually standing right in the front line, face, front line facing all that. With their hijabs and the niqabs, they are actually more, pro more prone to these kind of activities more than the Muslim men themselves because they stand out clearly as the odd one in the, in the society. Women in Islam are considered to be subjugated, degraded and oppressed with no rights. But is that really true? Are the millions and millions of Muslims that are living around the world are that oppressive or is it something, a misconception that has been created by some biased opinions of the society. What is the role of the culture for the women in the Muslim world? Women in Islam is a subject of great distortion and manipulation with, be, partly because there is not a lot of information out there or partly because of some misinformation or misunderstanding and some actions of some Muslims which has been taken into, into account as the teachings of Islam. Today we here teach you of what actually the Islam teaches and what is the standard and what is the criterion that you should use in order to judge a Muslim. Our source of information is the Holy Quran, our book uh, from Allah, the word of Allah and the authentic teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, his sayings, his actions, his deeds, his confirmations through his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all and also the scholars of Islam. We may have our differences in terms of religion and belief, but we can discuss them in a humble way and understand each other. We are not here to confront with anybody. We are here to make peace and promote peace. We are here to have a respectful dialogue. Dear brothers and sisters in humanity, it is okay to have a difference of opinion, but it is very important that your difference of opinion is conveyed in a humble way and in a graceful manner. You are our guest and we want to make sure that when you walk out of this room today, you have a lot of compassion, optimism and love and respect towards all the Muslims that are, that are living around the world and in your neighborhood as well. And when you face an Islamophobe, you, you can actually represent us in front of them. All right. So, <clears throat> without any further ado and wasting more time, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, uh, who's going to be Dr. Sabil Ahmad. All right. So just give me a second. I'm going to... All right. So Dr. Sabil Ahmad, it, Dr. Sabil Ahmad is the director of... of Gain Peace Project, an outreach project of Islamic Circle of North America. Gainpeace.com's aim is to bring out the commonalities and build bridges between people of various faith, races and nationalities. Dr. Sabil has given many outreach presentations and workshops in various cities in the USA on the topic of Sharia, freedom of speech, comparative religion and youth empowerment. After, the, after completing his medical education from the Caribbean, he decided to dedicate his time as a full-time educator of Islam to tackle Islamophobia and to convey the peaceful message of Islam. He was born and raised in Hyderabad, India and moved to the USA more than 20 years ago. He is married with three children and resides in, with his family in Morton Grove, Illinois. So please welcome Dr. Sabeel Ahmed. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Wa naudhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassilli amri wa ahlul uqdatan bil lisani yafqahu khawli. Everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy and blessings of Almighty God be upon each single one of you. Those who are not from the Islamic faith, you will be surprised to find out that this was the greeting, the greeting of peace that all the prophets and messengers of the past, they used to greet their disciples with. For example, when Jesus, when he met his disciples in the upper chamber, the very first thing that he mentioned to them was peace be upon you. 
So this is in the Gospel of John chapter 20 verse number 19. So what we say is that we Muslims, we are following the traditions, the rituals and the message of all the prophets of God, namely Jesus, Moses, Abraham, peace be upon each single one of them. Now the topic in before us is the topic of women in Islam and are they empowered or are they subjugated? Now the reason we chose this topic is because according to the Pew Research Foundation survey Muslims they only get 28% of the points or the 28, 48% of the people in the USA they give positive points or they have positive perception about women in Islam, about Muslims in general. Compared to the other groups, we have 67% for the Jewish people, Catholics they get 66% and the rest of the groups. So the lowest in the spectrum unfortunately are the Muslim or Islam in the perception of our fellow Americans. When it comes to the Republicans, I think it's about 63 or 68% and the rest of the groups up there. So I believe when people, when they have lack of education, lack of education, sometimes it leads to hate and bias and discrimination and violence. And unfortunately, we see some of the aftermath of the lack of education. It leads to sometimes attacks like these, like the Muslim girl, she was being bullied to such an extent that she was physically attacked by her her, her, her schoolmates. And this one more incident up here. A Muslim lady, white Caucasian convert to Islam, she was stabbed because of her hijab, because that she's a Muslim woman. People don't understand what hijab stands for. They think it's a symbol of subjugation. In Detroit, many of you may have seen this. A Muslim lady just coming up there getting the treatment, she's at the counter, and from the back somebody came and they really pounded on her. Lack of education. A group of teenage girls spit on, beat hijab wearing women in downtown Brooklyn and call us terrorist. Lack of education. So lack of education we may think, you know, fine. Lack of education may be just, people may not know about each other. But lack of education, or fear of the unknown many a times leads towards fear and, and, and hate and bias and, and ultimately attacks like these. So the reason we are having this program is we have seen many, many times, and this is just human psychology, when people, when they come to meet with each other face to face, connections are being made. We tend to see that at the end of the day, we have so many things in common. And at the end of the day, we see each other's humanity. And at the end of the day, that will help us to work with each other for projects that are going to better humanity and society at large. So the good news is this, according to that same survey, when a person gets to know a Muslim, that means their perception of Islam and Muslims, it rises. It becomes positive. So the survey shows it, and we know by our experience, knowing and meeting each other, it helps us to understand the person better. So that is the reason, my dear friends, that we are having this program. So you may be thinking, you know, Sabil, who are the Muslims around you? So Muslims and what do we believe? So before we introduce the program about women in Islam itself, it is good to know in the context of women in Islam, who are the Muslims and what do they believe? So really quickly, if I'm going to ask this quiz question to all of you, especially the guests who are not from the Muslim faith, when do you think Muslims started to come to the USA? By the raise of hands, uh, make sure that no one is Googling now, right? <laughs> All right? So just the raise of hand, what would you say? Raise of hand, please. Oh, I have to raise my hand and tell you? Come on. <laughs> yes, ma'am, go for it. Okay, well, I'm going to guess because I have no clue. Uh, how about C, the 1720s? 1720s. Is that your final answer? <laughs> uh, how about B, the 1820s? Are you going to go one by one now, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, take one more guess. Now we are, we are down to three. Yes, sir? 
18, 20. So now we are down to two. Now we have 50, 50 chance. Yes, ma'am. All right, give her a big hand. She got it. Oh my God. Okay, 15, 20. Yes. According to New York Times, Muslim presence in the USA initially started from Austin, Texas, by the way. Yes. You know, I'm not sure why Austin, right? Of all the places in the US. 1520s, actually 1528 to be exact. Wow. So the point I'm trying to make is Islam and Muslims are part and parcel of the USA even before the founding of this nation of the USA. So we are as old in the USA as Judaism and Christianity. And Muslims are celebrating our fasting, our holidays way before our Christian friends. They started, they started to celebrate uh, Christmas with the Christmas tree. Mr. Trump, you're hearing that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Muslims in America. Now, this is a depiction of many, many Muslims who fought alongside George Washington for the freedom of this country. So there were many Muslims who fought uh, alongside Washington. Bampit Muhammad was one. Yusuf bin Ali was the second one. And many, many others. So in the year 1975, the U.S., to recognize their contributions, they took out a stamp. Especially one of the Muslims, Salem Poor was his name. He sacrificed his life for the freedom of this country. Way back, 18, 1970, uh, 1776. What, which country's flag is that, by the way? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, take a shot, anyone. Persia. Yes, go for it. China. You know, it's very close to Chinese flag, by the way. Very good guess. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, so, the rebel flag? The rebel? Rebel from your schools? No, no, no. Like, in the war, you, there was Union soldiers and the rebel soldiers. Oh, wow. That's a very good guess. Suppose if I tell you that this is a flag of a country in Africa, and the country's name starts with the letter M. Now I'm... It's a really important hint for you. Morocco. There you go, Morocco. It's a Moroccan flag, by the way. All right, yeah, give him a big hand. Yes, why not? His wife is clapping for him. <laughs> now, the, you may be thinking, you know, what does Morocco has to do with the presentation about women in Islam? There is a relevance to it. Of all the countries in the world, the very first country that recognized the United States of America's freedom and independence was none other than the country of Morocco. Yes. Not France or Germany or Russia or China and definitely not UK, right? A Moroccan, a Muslim country of Morocco. Now when we look at uh, the, when did the iftar or the fasting or Ramadan celebrated the very first time in the White House? It was in 1805 in the time of uh, Jefferson. And there were 300 plus Muslims who fought alongside Abraham Lincoln for the, for the unity of the country and for the freedom of the slaves. Yes, many, many of them. And this is one of those uh, Muslims, Moses Osman, who sacrificed his life for the freedom of the slaves and the, for the unity of this country. And what about the recent contributions, by the way? What, what, what uh, building that you see up there? Sears for the Buddhist Tower, right? This was the main architect of that building was none other than Fazlur Rahman, a Muslim immigrant coming from Bangladesh. To such an extent, he did contribution to the architecture and to the designing aspect of the USA that his call as the father of tubular engineering. And before his time, the skyscrapers did not used to be that high, but after he invented that kind of designing, now the skyscrapers, now they are like more than 100 or even now 200 uh, stories high. All the skyscrapers in the world that belongs to Mr. Trump, they use his engineering. <laughs> There's a fact, yes? Even the Trump Tower in Chicago, by the way. YouTube, all of us, we watch YouTube. One of the founders of YouTube, his name is Javid Karim, his father who came from Bangladesh. Again, one of the Muslims who contributed to this wonderful country of USA. Now, iPhone. 
Steve Jobs was not a Muslim, but his father was a Muslim coming from Syria. You guys like ice cream cones? Yeah. yeah? Now the ice cream cone was invented by a Muslim in the 1904 World Fair in St. Louis. Yeah, did you knew that? I didn't know that. You didn't know that, right? What happened was in the World Fair, a lot of people were there. People were enjoying the food, the drink in the World Fair. And the Muslim vendor, he was selling Arabic sweets and Arabic uh, cuisine. Next to him was an ice cream uh, booth, ice cream parlor. He ran out of the ice cream cups. He only had the, the ice cream without any cups. So the Muslim, when he found out that there are no cups, what he did, the Muslim, he rolled up the sweet dough in the form of a cone and he told the person next to him, why don't you put the ice cream cone, the scoop on top of it? And that's how it became the ice cream cone. Thanks to the Muslim, right? Next time you enjoy the ice cream cone from McDonald's, yeah, why not give a big hand <laughs> to the Muslim? Looks like you like, you like ice cream so much. I do like ice cream. Yeah, we all do, right? Uh, when we are fasting, by the way, let's not speak about food. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so it's really important. Muslims are, are part and parcel of the USA even before the country became the United States of America. And these are some of the prominent Muslims that you see. You see the civil rights activists, you have Muhammad Ali in the sports, you have uh, Dave, Dave Chappelle, uh, you have Nobel Prize winners, you have politicians. Uh, Keith Allison became the very first Muslim in the US Congress and then the rest of them, each single one of them doing humongous contribution to the landscape of United States of America. What about Islam in the world? What is Islam? These are some of the faces of Islam, Muslims. A Muslim does not have to be a person who looks like me or a brown or African American or Arab. In fact, if you look at the statistics, 1.7 billion Muslims around the world, only 19% of them, they're from the Arab background. Which country do you think is the most populous Muslim country in the world, by the way? More Muslims live in that country than any country in the world. Is it Saudi Arabia? Is it Egypt? Yes, ma'am, what do you think? All right, give her a big hand. She got it again. <laughs> All right, wonderful. It's two for two. So again, very important. There are more Muslims living in Indonesia, Malaysia, and India, Pakistan, Bangladesh than all the Middle Eastern Muslims combined. So Islam is a universal faith. Any person can be a Muslim as long as they testify to the oneness of God and in the messengership of Prophet Muhammad. Peace of bless, peace and blessings of God be upon him. There are 57 Muslim majority countries in the world and close to 500,000 Muslims they live in the United States in, in Chicago. About close to 7 million in the USA. So what do we believe? Consistently we have these fundamental beliefs. First and foremost we believe that there is only one God. And the name of God we say in Arabic is Allah. Just like in Hebrew language, in the Old Testament language, Yahweh or Jehovah is the name. Same creator, different name. In the language of Prophet Jesus, his name was, his language was Aramaic. In that language, the name for God is Ilah or Allah, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, by the way. In the language of Spanish, it is Dios. In the language of Norwegian, it's God. The bottom line is, in the language of Arabic, the name Allah is mentioned. So when we say the word Allah, we don't mean a different God, God of the Muslims, Arabs, tribal God. We say he's the same creator in the Arabic language. You know, I have uh, 300 Bibles in my collection, by the way. I'm a Bible collector. And my wife is not happy about that. The whole basement shelf by shelf is full of Bibles. And one of the Bibles which I have is the Arabic translation of the Bible. Lo and behold, 17 times in the very first page of the Bible in Arabic, in the book of Genesis, the word Allah occurs 17 times in the very first page. For example, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse number 1 says, In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. Just to drill the point that Allah is the same creator who created all of us. These are some of the attributes of God. We say that God is eternal. That means any entity who is eternal does not need to have parents. We say that God does not have any sons and 
daughters or uncles and aunts. He is one, he is unique and he is the creator of all of us. We say that he is a sustainer. He is merciful and forgiving and two important attributes of God is that God is al walud he is a loving creator. You know the snacks that some of you may have eaten in the back, the water up there, the air that we breathe, we say that these are the blessings coming from the creator because he loves humanity. And then we say that the love of God, you know when we love our children, our spouses, our families, our parents or anyone else, love means we want to help, we want to help that person who we love. We care for the person. So Islam says that when God, when he loves humanity, he would like to guide humanity. To guide humanity, we say that God himself did not came down and became part of the creation or a human being or an idol or part of the creation. He remained God and he started to send prophets and messengers and send guidance through the prophets and messengers. So we say that the very first prophet of Islam is none other than the very first person, the very first man that God has created. His name obviously is Adam. So here again is the commonality, right, between Judaism, Christianity, and obviously Islam. So we say that when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them the commandment that enjoy all the things in paradise. But stay away from this one important tree. Enjoy all the things, but stay away from this tree. But as we know, they made the very first mistake. But here is a slight difference between the Quranic perception of Adam and Eve and the biblical narration of Adam and Eve. So according to the Bible, who made the very first mistake by the way? Eve. Eve, right? Well actually the Bible says the woman, uh, yeah. correct? In that way. But according to Islam, it's really important, both Adam and Eve, they were equally responsible for the very first mistake. So I say that equality in Islam starts from day one, right? So speaking about women's rights, we say way back, going back literally thousands of years, equality started right there in the eyes of God. Equally they made the mistake. But again God says in the Quran that equally they both repented to God and equally God forgave their sins. So Islam does not believe in the original sin, we believe in the original forgiveness and the original goodness. We say that every child is born without any sin or blemish, we are born with original goodness, pure, innocent, without any blemish, clean slate. Only after they reach the age of puberty, if they commit any sin, they will be responsible. They can ask for forgiveness. If they do any good, they will be rewarded. But a child, according to Islam, is born with the natural inclination to worship on God, no blemish. So God, by His mercy and His guiding nature, He he sent revelation to different prophets and messengers. The main crux, the main message that he sent to Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them and the rest of the prophets, is the revelation of invite your people that they should not worship idols. They should not worship the, 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 the animals, the sun, the plant, the trees, the humans. They should only worship one God. So that submission to one God in Arabic language is Islam. So we say, and this is a really important fact for each single one of the guests who are here, we say that the message of Islam, absolute submission to one God, was not started by Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was given as a guidance to the very first man, Adam, and the rest of the prophets and the messengers, they were given that same message. Invite your people to submit to one God, and that submission to one God in Arabic is Islam. Is that news for you? Yeah, that's news for many of us. We say that Abraham came with the message of Islam. So anyone who follows Islam, what is the name of that person by the way? Just like you have Christianity and Christians, Buddhism and Buddhists, Islam and Muslims, yes. So we say that all the prophets and the messengers, they came with the message of submission to one God, which is Islam. And obviously, connecting the dots, we say that all the, any person who follows Islam, we say that person is a Muslim. So we say that Adam was a Muslim. 
we say that abraham and even jesus we say that he was a muslim because he used to submit to one god in fact it says in the quran it says so these are the chapters and the verses from the quran by the way it says in the quran chapter number 3 verse number 51 speaking about jesus god says inna allah rabbi wa rabbukum fa'budu hadha siratan mustaqim so jesus is saying to his people that verily allah god is my law and your lord worship him alone and that is the right path speaking about abraham it says in the quran that he was neither a jew nor a christian but he was a hanif he was a muslim that means he used to submit only to one god not worshiping idols or humans or creation but only submitting to one god so really quickly on this slide some people they believed in the message of oneness of god but some people they deviated from the message and they started to worship idols or humans or the creation but god by his loving guiding merciful nature he appointed prophet after prophet to bring them back again right so this is like a brief glimpse and the history of islam so here are some of the prophets and the messengers and you'll be surprised to find out that many of the prophets mentioned in the quran are also there in the old testament and new testament for example the arabic name for abraham is ibrahim so i have two sons and one daughter in the back two of my sons their name after two of the prophets mentioned in the old testament abraham in english ibrahim in arabic that's my older son my second son his name is yusuf joseph right and we know joseph story from the old testament the reason i'm showing this slide is because it shows the commonality that we have it shows that a no muslim can be a muslim if we don't respect or believe and honor any one of these prophets i have to believe in jesus to be a muslim but obviously we take jesus to be a mighty prophet but here is a quiz question to all of you especially our guest over here of all the prophets mentioned in the quran which one do you think is mentioned the most by name in the quran okay raise your hand please there are 25 of them mentioned in the quran oh you want to go over to try oh, you know the answer <laughs> okay if the guess if they don't know the answer then i will come for you right mm -hmm. a hint is he is the greatest prophet of the old testament his name starts with m moses yes prophet moses peace be upon him right was that your answer too yes so just imagine muslims honor moses to be one of the greatest prophets mentioned in the quran and he is also one of the greatest prophets of the old testament his story is mentioned his, his miracles are mentioned his message of oneness of god is mentioned same thing with prophet jesus peace be upon him Jesus is mentioned 25 times in the Quran with respect and honor. You know speaking about Jesus let me quickly mention about uh, the mother of Jesus. What was her name by the way? Mary. Mary, right? You will be surprised to find out that of all the women ever existed there is only one lady mentioned in the Quran by name and that one lady is none other than Mary the mother of Jesus. Surprised? Yeah. not the mother of muhammad peace be upon him not his wife or not his daughter or none of the believing women in the time of the 7th century but quote and quote a jewish lady from 600 years before muhammad peace be upon him who prophet never met she is the one who is honored in the quran by name the only person mentioned by name only lady in fact there are 109 114 chapters in the quran chapter number 19 is named the chapter the surah of maryam mary in fact it says in the quran chapter 3 verse number 42 god sent an angel to mary and the angel is saying that oh mary god has chosen you god has purified you and god has chosen you above all the women look at the honor she is mentioned 32 times in the quran with respect and honor and about 18 times in the new testament by the way if anyone is keeping any score or any facts right 
that shows the respect, the honor that we give. You know, I have read the Bible, the Vedas, the Quran, many other scriptures. I would say, especially compare Quran and the Bible, 65% of the things are in common. So one of the main take-home points from today's lecture is that let's come to the commonalities that God has given to us. And on that platform of commonalities, we can build bridges and we can have projects for the betterment of humanity. So that's one of the reasons that we are here. So really quickly, before we go to women in Islam topic, these are the six beliefs in Islam. Oneness of God is the very first one. Believe in angels, believing in all the prophets. The first one, Adam, the last one, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Believing in the divine books. We say that God gave certain books, certain scriptures and revelation to the previous prophets. Jesus was given a book. So were David and Abraham and Moses, peace be upon them. We believe in those books in the original form in which they came. And the last and the final book that we believe is none other than the Quran. We say that Quran is the final revelation. So we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we say this is the last testament. And this last testament, you'll be surprised to find out again that God has given a guarantee that he's going to protect this book from any alteration, it getting lost, any addition, or it getting corrupted. So there is a prophecy in the Quran, chapter 15, verse number 9, that it is God who sent this message, God is going to protect this book. And again, you know, in the month of Ramadan, how many of you have been to a mosque, by the way, those who are not from the Muslim faith? None of you have been to the mosque. You know, you're all invited, by the way. We have the mosque in Aurora, Naperville, Bolingbrook, and any suburb that you live. We have 130 mosques in the Chicagoland area. About 3,000 in the USA. So you're welcome to come to the mosque. If you come to the mosque, when you see Muslims pray the five times prayer, the person who's reciting the imam, the leader who's leading the prayer, he would be, recall, he would be reciting from his memory passages from the Quran. In fact, Almost always he would be a person who memorized the whole book. Yeah. And how many pages of uh, the Bible have you memorized, <laughs> right? You may not, right? Or those who are going to schools and colleges. It's not easy for us to memorize like the first five pages of the book of calculus, for example. Brother Warren, have you memorized calculus? Five pages? No? <laughs> Ten million Muslims living now who memorize the whole Quran from the first page to the last page, in memory, in the Arabic language. And that's one of the miracles of the Quran. Then we believe in the day of judgment. Islam says that after we all pass away, God is going to bring us back to life. There would be a day, there would be a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. You know, just like when we went to school, there is an evaluation by the professor at the end of the semester, based on the criteria he or she has given to us. When we work anywhere, there is an evaluation of our three months, six months, or one year evaluation based upon the assignment our, our employer has given to us. In the same way, we say that this whole world is a classroom and the, our teacher professor is God, and he has given us certain criteria, worshiping one God and following guidance. So on the day of judgment, individually, each person would be standing in front of God according to Islam. And God would be judging us. What kind of belief that you had, what kind of deeds that you have done. And if the person had the right belief in one God and doing good deeds, it says God's mercy comes into play. The person is eligible to go to paradise. On the flip side of it, Islam does believe in the hellfire. You know, just like if he didn't follow our teacher's assignment, there would be consequences. In the same way, Islam says, if the person keeps on worshipping someone other than God, or associating partners with God, there would be consequences and there would be hellfire. Important. It's not up to me or any Muslim here or any Muslim around the world to condemn anyone else to hellfire. We cannot do it. Only God is the one who is going to have the final fair and just judgment based on the criteria of worshipping God and following God's guidance. Okay, so let me end the Islam brief presentation with this, then we really jump into the women in Islam topic. Who knows the five pillars, by the way? Any one of our guests? 
If not, let's quickly go over them. The very first pillar is to believe in the absolute oneness of God and in the messengership of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second pillar of God, the second pillar of Islam is to pray five times a day. Any of our guests have seen Muslims pray? You have, right? I mean, you'll be surprised to find out the way that Muslims are praying, other prophets, they used to pray the same way. In the book of Numbers, it says in the Old Testament that Moses and his, and his uh, followers and Aaron, they used to bow down, they used to worship the one creator. It says in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 17, verse number 3, that when the time for prayer came, Abraham used to go to a nice secluded place, place his forehead on the ground, he used to worship one God. It says about Jesus in the, in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, when people were coming after him, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Over there, he prayed to God that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. When he was saying that, he was putting his forehead on the ground and praying to God. So again, an important point, Muslims are following the previous prophets and the messengers in also worshipping. 2.5% of our saved wealth, our saved assets, we give each year to the poor, the needy, and the homeless. It is part of the Islamic faith. If we don't do it, we, are not, uh, we will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> and number fourth pillar is fasting in the month of fasting, right? What is this month called, by the way? The month of? Ramadan. Ramadan, yes, which is the ninth month of the fast, ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. In this month, for the whole month, we fast from dawn to sunset. So in the Chicago land area, it is about 16 plus hours, right? Close to 16 hours. No water, no food, nothing, not even a drop of water, by the way. Have you ever fasted that long? No. No? You may, you may be thinking, you know, it may be like really hard. It is hard, by the way. I mean, we are humans, right? Just like you. But we are doing it because we want to please the Creator. You know, even my son, even when I was like seven, eight years old, I started to fast. In fact, my son, he's in fourth grade. He woke up with us in 3 a.m. in the morning. He ate some bread or peanut butter or chocolate milk, and then he went to sleep after praying. And he's fasting the whole day. So the reason Muslims are fasting is because it's a commandment from God. And fasting is not just fasting from food and water. Fasting is also fasting from any other bad things that we were doing. We are supposed to give them up. Lying and backbiting and cheating and breaking promises and call, uh, anything that we were doing, we are supposed to give them up for the rest of our lives. And fasting is also we want to inculcate all the wonderful things that we should be doing and make them part of our life. So it's a, it's a boot camp for the Muslims, right? And last but not the least, once in a lifetime, we go to pilgrimage to Mecca. All right. Before Islam came to Arabia, what was the status of women around the world? According to Encyclopedia Britannica, it says that in India, subjection was a cardinal principle Day and night must women be held by their protectors in a state of dependence, says the Manu. The rule of inheritance was agnatic, that is, descent traced through males to the exclusion of the females. So this was the situation, the dark ages when Islam came to Arabia, the situation in India. You know, in fact, for many, many centuries, if a husband dies in the cremation, the widow also have to go and join him in the fire. Yes. And we may be thinking, you know, dark ages. Yes, they were dark ages. For many, many centuries, until the 1950s, I believe this was banned in India. This was the situation before Islam came there. What about the Roman law, by the way? It says that a woman was even in historical times completely dependent. If married, she and her property passed into the house of her husband. Dark ages before Islam came to Arabia. What about the Mosaic law? To betroth a wife to oneself means simply to acquire possession of her 
by payment of the purchase money. This was the situation before Islam came to Arabia. A woman being a man's property. She was in fact a property of the husband or the father before Islam came to Arabia. Even in the English common law, by the way, she's been seen as a property. She did not have any rights. Even in Arabia, similar situation, really important, similar situation. She was treated as a property, no inheritance, no right. To such an extent, it was dark ages, you'll be surprised to find out that it was embarrassing in a family before Islam came into Arabia for the families to have a girl being born in that family. After the birth of the girl, they used to wrap her up and instead of taking her to home, they used to walk to the cemetery. They used to dig a hole in the cemetery and the live baby girl, she used to be buried alive. That was the situation. Those were the dark ages. But if you are shaking our head that, you know, those were the Arabs before Islam came, what about in the USA, close to 40 million fetuses aborted, buried alive. We are still going through dark ages, my dear friends, when it comes to the abortions, 40 million of the fetuses. So what about Islam? When Islam came, it literally brought light to the world. It uplifted women equal to men in the eyes of the Creator. So, but many a times, our friends, our non-Muslim neighbors and colleagues, they may judge Islam based upon the cultural practices. Is that not so, by the way, right? Many a times that happens. But when people, when they say or judge Islam by that, I, I mention to them that, you know, according to our constitution, our laws and regulations, Equal Pay Act requires that if a man works in that job, a lady doing the same job, she should be getting equal pay. That's fair, correct? That's fair. But is that the reality on the ground? It's not. For every dollar a man makes, a lady, she makes only like 77 cents. That's not fair, correct? That's not fair at all. The point I'm trying to raise is, you may have wonderful constitution, but the realities on the ground may be something else. In the same way, my dear friends, my dear guests, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, we have the best constitution here. We say that this is a guidance coming from God. It uplifted women. It gave them the rights. But then, maybe some cultures, they may have taken away the rights. So it's important for us not to judge Islam or the Quran based upon the cultural practices of some uneducated Muslims or in, in the Muslim countries. Really important point. In the same way, we should not judge the constitution of the USA by the practices on the ground. If we want to know what Islam is, we need to read the Quran. We need to consult the practicing or the Muslims who are practicing Islam. According to the Georgetown campus, it says that the disparity is so much and the gap is not coming together, it wrote an article in there that women can't win. And look at the disparity again over here. Degree by degree, according to the disparity here. Anyone who has a master's degree, look at the red line that you see, is what women are making for the same job with the master's degree. 83,000 compared to 121,000 for the men. Every single field there is a disparity. The bottom line is cultural practices may be different than the actual code of law written in the book. In the same way, cultural practices in some Muslim countries may be quite different from what the Quran teaches, what is the gold standard. Now many a times we speak about equality. This is equity. We should shoot for equity, not equality. Because if we shoot for equality, this is equality. If the man says that, you know, we are both equal, why don't you lift the same amount of weight as I am lifting? So what you see the picture on that side, 
on your right side is equality means both let's both of us do the same work lift up the same weight have the same kind of uh, you know what man is doing but this is equity equity means that you are fair based upon the person's background based upon the person's knowledge and experience so equity is what islam shoots for not equality equality spiritually but when it comes to the daily practices islam has distributed the role of the genders husband or the father or the son has certain roles in the society mothers wives daughters sisters they have equally good roles in the society and they get equal reward both of them they get equal reward based upon if they fulfill their roles and that is equity that is justice and fairness so really important when we speak about all of these equal rights we need to really ponder and think what are we looking for actually so spiritual equality this is what quran says that oh mankind so this is god speaking by the way so god is saying that oh mankind be conscious of your duty to your lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate of the same kind and from them it spread the multitude of men and women a really important point from this is that the same essence that god created adam with the same essence god created eve with they are created from that same soul from the same essence so spiritually we are equal in the eyes of the creator very important passage from the quran then when it comes to uh, again spiritual equality it says that never will i waste the work of a worker among you whether male or female one of you being equal to each other so these are passages from the quran by the way again chapter 49 verse number 13 says indeed the noblest of you in the eyes of allah is the most pious again it's speaking about both male and female equally in the eyes of god the reason i'm mentioning my dear friends is i'm going to the source of islam which is the quran we are not going about certain scholar certain culture these are the teachings of islam when it comes to islam and women again when it comes to equality or in the spiritual sense between men and women this is a long passage it speaks in 33 chapter 33 verse number 35 speaks about how men and women are equal in the eyes of god men and women who believe who obey god who are humble who give alms who fast who guard their chastity and modesty who people men and women they would be forgiveness and a vast reward equal reward for both men and women as they do all of this wonderful guidance practices that god has given again equality spiritually in the eyes of the creator now what about how does islam honor our daughters our wife our mothers it's really important for us to know this you know when it comes to uh, daughters before islam came to arabia people used to be embarrassed to have daughters how did prophet muhammad peace be upon him elevated and reminded the people that having daughters is one of the ways to go to paradise so muhammad peace be upon him he says the muslim who has two daughters and he look after them well they will lead him to paradise such a wonderful saying instead of taking the daughters to grave the daughters are leaving the parents to paradise such an honor what about the wife or the wives muhammad peace be upon him he says that the best amongst you is the one who is the best towards his wife so all the husbands are listening right <laughs> right this is a really wonderful saying by the way you know when we look at the life of muhammad peace be upon him he was a prophet he was the head of the state and he was also a husband he was one of the family members just like all of us when he used to come home he used to do the housework he used to serve his family he used to stitch his own clothes he used to milk his own goats and he used to help and serve his family even though he was a prophet because equally he used to help out just like any women 
just like any daughter, just like any mother, he was an equal partner in the household. Really important fact, by the way. When it comes to mothers, Paradise lies under the feet of your mothers. Before Islam came, the whole world was trampling on the women. After Islam came, even paradise lies under the feet of the mothers. The prestige Islam gives to mothers. In fact, one Muslim came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asked him a really important question that of all the people in the world who should be my alliance my my uh, kindness should go towards Muhammad peace be upon him he said your mother then the person asked the question again then who because the person is expecting a different answer so the Prophet said your mother the third time when the person asked the question, who should be my kindness go towards? The Prophet said, your mother. The fourth time, the Prophet said, your father. So if men and women are sp playing spiritual Olympics, uh, the mother wins the gold medal, the silver medal, and the bronze medal, and poor dads, they come home with the consolation prize. <laughs> right? That's the prestige. So really important. In true Islam, there is no concept of nursing homes. The nursing home of the mother and the father is the home of the child. Yes, that's the honor, the prestige Islam has given to parents. What are some of the rights that Islam has given to women? Now, these are coming from the Quran and from the, from the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. We are not speaking about the cultures, by the way, right? Cultures may have their own way of looking at women. She has the she has the right to either deny or to accept a marriage proposal. That means there is no such thing in Islam as forced marriages. There is no such thing, by the way. If you hear that somebody is getting forcefully married, that is culture, and here is Islam, the gold standard. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to having the last name, you know, when I got married, the clerk of the Cook County Court, he asked my wife, what should I change your last name to? My wife was not happy hearing that question, by the way, right? He was saying, why would you like to change my name, change his name, right? So Islam gave them the right to have their last name as their parents has given to them. They have the right to be given a marital gift, which is called as meher, right? And they have the right to, uh, they have the right uh, to initiate a divorce if they want to. So they have that right. They have the right to gain knowledge and they have the obligation to gain knowledge. Really important. So in case if you hear in some Muslim countries that women are denied those rights, that uh, somebody is uh, destroying the girls' schools and the colleges and preventing them and placing some hurdles, that is culture and this is Islam. Really important. If she wants to go and work outside, if there is a need, she can go and work outside. And we have many professional Muslim ladies, by the way, who are going and working outside. So whatever she earns belongs to her. Whatever her husband earns also belongs to her, and she is the queen of the house. <laughs> she doesn't have any financial obligation at all when it comes to the household. A man, a, like for me, I have to support my wife. She can be a multi-billionaire, by the way, if I'm working and making like, even like the minimum wage, even then I have to support her. That is a humongous right that Islam has given to women. She has the right to have her last name. She has the right to own property. You'll be surprised to find out that in this country, not until 1861 in the state of Illinois, a lady, she won the right to own property. You know, like right now, any one of us, any one of the ladies here, you can take your cash, your check, you're in your car, you can go and buy a car, a land, a home, but that you could not have done it before 1861. But Islam gave them the right to women, Muslim women in the 7th century. The right, the right to gain education. 
In fact, the right to have a say in the political process, when did the women win the right to vote over here in this country? 1920, right? Islam gave women the right to have a say in the political process in the 7th century. So look at it. Islam. Before you have the Magna Carta, the US Constitution, and the United States, all of the rights and the regulation, before all of that, Islam came to uplift the women and gave them those humongous, comprehensive rights before any country, any constitution. So what is the role, and I'm going to end with this, inshallah, God willing. What is the role of Muslim women? As a dynamic person, she can do almost anything. Look at this, as an activist, and we have many activists, Muslim ladies all around the world, and she's just one example, by the way. She was one of the founders, or she was one of the lead organizers of the Women's March in 2017, January or February of last year, Sister Linda Sarsour. Many of the Muslim families, we went out in downtown, and some of the girls, they are back in, they're in the back, by the way, they had the signs. Right after the 17 children, they died, they were gunned down in Parkland School, we went out as Muslims, as Americans, as humans, to speak out against gun, gun violence. They can be in the sports. As you can see, Ittihaj Muhammad, 2014 world champion. And these are some of the Muslim women who won gold, bronze, and silver medal in 2016 Olympics. They can be Nobel Prize winners. And we have seen many, many women that won Nobel Prize just in the last 20 years. These are some of the roles. She can be in the field of education. To such a degree, she can be the leader of all the teachers, as this lady, by the way. She won the very first prize in the world to be as the best teacher in the world. Here is a quiz question for all of you. Of all the campuses, all the universities, all the colleges in the world, which one do you think is the oldest continuous university in the history of the world? Any guesses? Is it UIC? Is it Cambridge, Harvard, Penn State, Oxford? No? Which one do you think? It's the one that she started. Oh, okay. There you go. That's an easy guess, right? In the context of the lecture, it has to be her, right? So which campus, by the way? <laughs> oh, you, you cheated. You saw one of those. <laughs> OK, good. So in the same country, the very first country that, that recognized the United States of America, in that same country, Fatima al fahri There you go. In the year 859, she laid the foundation to the oldest continuous university on the face of this earth, University of Kharawain, according to UNESCO and according to the Guinness Book of World Records. They can be attorneys. And there are many, many attorneys, by the way, not just as an attorney, but they are leading attorneys in the, in the world. They can be professors. They can be scholars. And there have been thousands of scholars in the history of Islam. And these are some glimpses of it. She is the main manuscript librarian in those campus. They can be judges, federal judge. But my dear friends, the greatest role that Allah or God has given to women is which one? The role of a? Mother. There you go. The role of a mother, yes. This is the best role that anyone can ever have. As being mother of Jesus, look at the prestige that is given to her. As the mother of the prophets, as the mother of the scholars, all the people that you have seen up there, they have been the mothers who laid the foundation. They are the ones who are laying the foundation for better societies. When we see any good person, any activist, any person who is moving and shaking the society, behind them is almost always the parents and especially the mothers. So this is the best role that Islam has given to the mothers. So at the end of the day, my dear Muslims and my dear guests, it's important for us to know that there may be many misconceptions which are out there. There may be many cultural biases that we may judge Islam and the Quran and what who Muslims are. But it's very important for us to know that here is the gold standard. 
And this gold standard, along with the sayings and the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him, they laid the foundation of uplifting the women from being nothing, no rights, to being something who is equal to man in the eyes of the Creator with humongous responsibilities and humongous honor, prestige, and reward. So let me end with this one important passage from the Quran. This is from chapter number 49, verse number 13 of the Quran. So God is speaking and God is saying and He's addressing all of us that all oh mankind, all oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and tribes and people that you get to know each other. That you get to know each other. Not that you may despise each other because of the differences, but you get to know each other. Then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered, God-fearing person. So I hope and pray that all of us coming together as brothers and sisters in, in, in this whole human family, that we can create societies which are based upon justice, morality, equality, and peace for all. And may God guide us and may God bless us. And thanks all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Zakallah khair, uh, Dr. Sabir, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. So we will now begin our Q&A session. Uh, like we had the protocol for the presentation, we have a protocol for the Q&A session as well. Anybody who is going to ask the question will raise their hand and then they will state their name followed by the question in a brief manner. And then um, we have three women panelists who are going to be answering the questions today. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when they respond to their question, we would request you to listen to the answer properly and ask your most important question first. Uh, we can allow you to ask second question, but keep in mind that we have a lot of people in this room and we would want to give everyone an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, so if there is no question, then we can uh, definitely come back to you for the second question. You can actually uh, clarify with the speaker, if, there, if, there is, if the response was not clear enough for you, you can actually ask for more clarification during your question. And also I want to mention to our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters who are part of the audience today, uh, we understand that this is a very passionate subject and it's a very sensitive subject, but we do have our designated panelists today who will be answering those, so we would request not to have any side comments or any uh, discussions, we can uh, actually go offline and talk to them in person so that we can use the time in a better way. So that, that is why I'm requesting all of you to uh, make use of this opportunity and uh, benefit everyone who's part of this group today. All right. So uh, let me uh, one by one introduce and bring over our f uh, three sister panelists today. Dr. Sabil is also going to be helping them if needed. It's my phone. <coughs> All right, so first of all, I'm going to bring uh, uh, request Sister Saima Shah to join us here. Sister Shai, uh, sisters, a brief introduction about her is that Sister Saima Shah is a teacher by profession. She is part of the national team of Muslim Children of North America, which, which comes under the Islamic Circle of North America, also known as ICNA. She has done a five years of intensive Quranic studies through ICNA. She is part of the classes offered by Bayina al Maghrib and IC ICNA online institutes. Uh, she considers herself as a student for life. She is also coordinating coordinates the youth program at the local Saturday school. She is part of the interfaith outreach committee at her local mosque. She is part of the diversity committee in her school district. She is also part of the international organization Human Library that works towards dispelling stereotypes. She lives in Oswego with her family. She is the mother of three kids. So we had so without. So we uh, welcome Simon, Sister Saima Shah. <clears throat> All right, our next sister is uh, Sister Fariha Shakil. 
she did her bachelor's degree in uh, psychology and uh, Braille. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And currently pursuing degree in early childhood education. She has served as president of the women's division of a major grassroots national Islamic organization for two terms. She loves to cook and try new recipes for her family and friends. She is married and a mother of five children and lives in Chicago for 22 years. So Sister Fariha Shakil. And then uh, finally, we have Sister Sarwat Ahmed. Um, her, uh, she has a master's degree in Near Eastern Studies from New York University, where she also did her undergraduate studies in Journalism and Middle Eastern Studies. She does medical billing for her husband. She is a freelance journalist covering local government and has been teaching Sunday school at the Bolingbrook Mosque for the past 10 years. She's also a member of Strategic Planning Committee at the Bolingbrook Mosque. She's a very busy wife and a mom of three active boys, but manages to fit in a number of things into her schedule. So please welcome Sister Sarwat Ahmed. And uh, I want to mention Dr. Sabil also would be assisting our sisters. Just give me a moment for uh, hooking up um, the microphone. Uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, I would request uh, Brother Wasim if you can help me with the microphone. Sorry. Um, as you can see, the three of us all dressed slightly differently, some a little bit more differently than others. Um, and from our understanding of the Quran, and we all have read the Quran and have ex understood it on our own, um, you know, we've come to our own decisions as to how much um, God wants us to cover. So um, Sister Saima is wearing a loose-fitting long abaya with her hijab, and she has her face and her hands uncovered. Um, Sister Fariha decided that she wanted to go a step further and co uh, cover her face as well. And I'm wearing uh, pants and a dress, and I'm wearing a hijab, um, and I have, you know, my face and my hands um, are uncovered. And this is our understanding of what the extent of God wants us to reveal and, and to cover. Um, so that's kind of, and the color, you know, I chose what I think is pretty. She chose the color she, I think she, that looks good on her, I guess. Um, and that's kind of how we decide how to dress. So personal decision. Yeah, for, yes, definitely, personal decision. You go ahead and then I'll say. So, oh, so there is, there is a guideline that Muslim men and Muslim women dress modestly. Modestly means that for women, cover your bodies completely uh, so that your body shape is not seen, loose clothing, not see-through, and then different cultures can interpret it in different way. You can go to different parts of the Muslim world, and Muslim women will be dressed differently according to the weather, according to their cultural uh, background, but then the guidelines are dress modestly, loose, clothing so that your body shape is not seen, so that you are identified as a Muslim woman, so that you're identified as you being um, serving God, and that you be known for who you are rather than your body or your physical appearance, be known for your intellect, for your women of God. And so then we accordingly, uh, for uh, according to our own kind of likes and dislikes, we kind of dress uh, hoping that we're fulfilling those guidelines. Hello everyone, so this is really a nice question and I would also like to share my input that um, I might seem the most different <laughs> among the whole panel. Um, so the, uh, the, the commandment of God is in, is in Quran, is in the holy book, and then the way it is interpreted by scholars, it's, it's, kind, it's, it's, it's a wide range. So let's say, um, as Simon already mentioned, that the, the verse is there in Quran where God says that the woman should dress modestly. And then a group of scholars would say that, okay, you, I mean, it's a, uh, consistent of all the scholars that they say cover your head and your upper body um, and then as she said loose clothing and um, some other um, conditions as well but then uh, another group of scholars say that if you cover your face and that's your choice if you cover your face that's another higher level to get closer to God another effort to get closer to God and actually the wives of the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him they all used to cover their faces so when it came to my choice I mean uh, they picked not to cover their face, and I picked to cover my face. So it's a it's a range of selection for a Muslim woman. Yeah. 
I wanted to just kind of add that definitely as Sister Saima has said that hijab we cover because this is as we believe as believing Muslim women that this is a commandment of God. Um, but for me it aside from that commandment of God to be modest and to have agency over our own private body. I mean, that's the way that I see it. We have agency over our private bodies. But aside from that, for me, the hijab also centers my identity. And not only um, kind of in an outward sense, like in front of all of you guys, you see me at Sister Saima said, I'm recognized as a Muslim woman, but it centers my identity as someone within myself. Um, it reminds me of my the values that I have decided to follow the principles that I am committed to and that defines my behavior, how I treat people, how I treat myself, how I treat my mother-in-law, how I treat my children, my husband, my community, um, and, and so that it really centers it in that way for myself. Even though I'm not a woman, but can I add something to it? Sure. Yeah, because we're speaking on the topic of modesty. So modesty is for both males for both women and men, by the way, really important. So just like Sister Saima and other ladies have mentioned over here, that they are supposed to cover certain parts of the body and males are also supposed to cover our bodies. We cannot wear tight clothes, we cannot wear transparent clothes, we cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender or extravagant, extravagant clothes to waste money. So the modesty is for both males and females, mentioned in the Quran and in the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Secondly, modesty is not limited to only what we wear. Modesty is the state of mind. Means what we say with our tongue, we have to be modest. You know, in fact, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that say something good or remain silent. That's the hijab of the tongue, I would say, right? <laughs> that saying. Then modesty of our ears. We should not be hearing bad things. Modesty of our interaction with the people of opposite genders. So these are, all, these, these are all fit into the concept of modesty, which is a state of mind. But modesty, the way that we are discussing here, it's not limited to what God said in the Quran. Modesty has always been there, even in the previous cultures, by the way. When you look at the Jewish ladies, according to the Talmud, she has to wear a scarf, especially when she's ma married. Hindu ladies, when I used to be in India, they used to be properly covered, even the Sikh ladies. You know, even when we look at uh, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 5 and 6, speaking to the Christian ladies, it speaks about the proper covering of their hair, especially when they're praying. You know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, when you see any one of her depictions, she's properly covered. Is she not? Modesty, just like our ladies over here, just the way that we honor them, we honor our ladies because they stand as a symbol of strength and empowerment. When you look at Mother Teresa, when we look at the Catholic nuns, they're all doing it because they want to obey the Creator and they want to be modest, they want to be judged, not by their bodies, but by their intellect, by their spiritualities, by their personalities, by their contributions. That's what God wants us to judge each other with. So it's a holistic concept. It benefits, uh, it's, it, it really benefits society, by the way. If people are chaste, society would be chaste. Society would be wholesome. We would not be objectifying ladies and women. You know, all these stories that you see in, in Hollywood, the, the producers, some of them are politicians, some of them are gymnastic coaches. Look what they're doing. So what we say is we want to honor our ladies our mothers, our wives, our daughters, equal to the status of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So that is the concept of modesty in Islam. Anybody else want to ask a question? Please. Oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, my name is Barbara Young. I live in North Aurora. Um, Dr. Ackman talked about the difference between the religious what we, women are treated in, in religion in the Quran and the way different, um, well, I'll say for lack of a better term, Arabic societies treat women culturally. What does the Islamic community, what is the Islamic community doing 
to promote the status of women, to prevent the subjugation of women culturally in Islamic countries. Okay, so I think the, the thing which we are doing right now, um, attending a, an event to educate ourselves, that's what basically we are focusing in our back home in our Islamic countries as well. Because the main reason I, we all feel that lack of education and lack of information, even though we are called Muslims, the countries are called Islamic countries, quote unquote. But the problem is that um, we take our religion for granted and we, most of the people, most of the population, they don't feel the need to go into the depth and to study and understand what is asked from us, um, from God to us. So basically I think um, the main focus of uh, those people who understand their religion and who are trying to practice it and, and to, who are trying to make the society a better place to live in, they are, they are they are striving so well in educating the other masses. And I think education and getting informed um, and creating awareness, that's the biggest, um, I mean, biggest, uh, you know, strength for us. Um, I don't have much to add to that because that really is the answer, right? Education, education, education. Um, for everything, whether it's education within our Islamic societies and ed education with our non-Muslim neighbors um, who, who don't know. It's our duty to educate ourselves and then to educate everyone else. And that really is the only way to get to where we need to get to, which is a true understanding of what Islam is, what, what Islam represents, and where we're going with it. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. I mean, education, uh, in, uh, I just want to say that education in our mosques as well, in terms of educating our community, a lot of the group Quran studies that are happening in the mosques are being led by women for women and teaching them this is what the Quran says um, and this is what the rights are and not just rights of women, everything. We have to understand everything the Quran says, not just about what it says about women because it says a lot of things about a lot of things, right? So that a lot of those classes and they're going online and they're being led by women. Women are taking classes, they're learning and then they're passing that on to other women in the community. And that really is the way to move forward. And that really is the way that we will dispel all of these cultural biases and get, get, get rid of those, the influence of those cultural biases in our religion and really get back to the root of what Islam was, was a very progressive religion which gave women a lot of rights. Um, so yes, like personally, when I was, I was born in Pakistan, so when I visited there recently, I did as many presentations as I could in different communities for teachers. I'm a teacher by profession myself, so uh, people who knew me said, you know, why don't you come and talk and give, like you live in America, you're a Muslim woman, you're practicing your faith there, and us living in Pakistan in the Muslim country are not doing somewhat of a good job as you are trying to do over there. like all of us. Um, and so, yeah, we try to educate. That is actually the bottom line. I'm not going to add to what they said, but let me just also take it from a different angle. What may be going on there in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, those countries, it's a human problem. It's not an Islamic problem. Really important. The reason I'm saying it's a human problem is because those ladies up there, they may look at you and look at the women in this country having pity on the women over here. How come they are so much subjugated? How much they are objectified? How come they are discriminated? When they look at the statistics of the women in this country, 93,000 of our ladies in this country, they are raped each single year, average. 7.8 million of our ladies in this country, they are they are abused by their spouses, physical abuse, by the way. 40 million fetuses are aborted. Hate, bias, discrimination at the job. So when they look at our ladies over here, they may ask you the same question, that how come you know, such a progressive country, advanced country, believing in Christianity, majority of them, 78%, how come they're going through all of these dark ages when it comes to women? So it's a human problem. As they said, it's education. It's not because of Muslims. It's not because of Islam. It's because of lack of education. When they were really educated back in the days, many, many centuries ago, even in the recent past, 
we see that when they actually apply the Quran and the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him, Muslim ladies especially, they were in the forefront of building pharmacies and hospitals and universities. So the gold standard is still there. We need to apply the gold standard, just like we have the gold standard here, the Constitution. But application is not there. Subjugation is here. The way that they will look at us, we are looking at them. And the main solution, obviously, would be education, I would say. Education forums. You know, all of the ladies sitting up here, these are leaders in the community. Sister Farhia, mashallah, she is, she is the national... Uh, President, she was the national president of the women in the USA, of, of Islamic Circle of North America. So in the same way, mashallah, the rest of the ladies, uh, Sister Sarva, she's a journalist. Sister Saima Asfar, she's an educationist. So there are many ladies around the world who are contributing. And again, gold standard is here. And the realities of the, on the ground is different. More education more reminding about the wonderful ways God has guided people. Once we listen to the guidance, every person in the society, technologically, morally, ethically, it will be advanced, inshallah. God willing. You had more questions. No questions. But if somebody else has a question, then we can come back to you, right? Just for the sake of fairness, but hold your thought, all right? So any question is good, by the way. You would, you know, we would rather have you ask questions here than go home and ask Mr. Google, right? <laughs> you may not get the right answer, especially from the qualified sisters who are sitting up here. And don't worry about offending us. Yeah, 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 actually, we'd rather you get the answer from yeah. us, as you said, than anybody else. Absolutely. So please don't worry about offending us about it. And no answer, no question is too small. Right. So. And the men over here, you can ask the question that you spoke about the women's rights. Do men have any rights in Islam? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not sure, right? We have to look at, maybe some of the lecture we can come to that. <laughs> yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, my name is Marilyn, and I'm from Aurora. I, I'm just interested in names. Like, how is the first name, last name, husband's name, what, uh, you know, yeah, how are, and who is sister that. and not sister? Sure, yeah, I have a story with that. Um, so, Name uh, is very important in Islam. A baby has a right to a good name. So most of our names have to have a good meaning. Like all of our names have to have good meaning. Almost all of them, all of us know what the meaning of our name is. So I was born in Ramadan, in the fasting month. And so my name, my, my grandfather gave me the name Saima, which means a person who fasts. Psalm is the month and Saima is the person who fasts. And then... I am known as Saima Shah. Everybody knows me as Mrs. Shah because my husband's name is Harun Shah. Um, but on my ID, it's Saima Hussein, and I haven't changed my last name. And my husband sometimes teases me. He says, he, you're not one of us, like, you know, with the kids, and he teases me. But again, you know, everybody knows me as Mrs. Shah because it's easy for school, you know, Mrs. Shah, the mother of, you know, so-and-so Shah um, in the hospitals and things like that. But no, actually, no, in the hospital, I was called, you know, Miss Hussein, and he was called Mr. Hussein, which drove him crazy. Um, but then, you know, I said, it just... So that's our story. Did not change my name. But proud of being a Mrs. Shah, absolutely. Yeah, that's totally up to us. So I, I selected my husband's first name after my marriage to be as my last name. And then my in-laws were like, well, there is a family name for us. Why did you choose your husband's first name but rather than choosing his last name, which is the, you know, the surname or the family name? And I said, it's my choice. I, I like his first name. I want myself to be associated with his first name. So it's, it's all up to our own choice and our own um, wish. So mine is a little different. Um, my husband, we really didn't discuss it, but I didn't change my name. Um, as a brother um, Sabil had said before, a woman doesn't have to change her name. This is really more of a Western concept than it is, um, you know, an Islamic concept at all. Women in Islam, Muslim women do who live in the Western world, and even women who live in the Muslim world, they do change their names. I think it's more um, influence of, yeah. of colonial influence than anything else. Uh, my name is Sarvath S. Ahmed. Um, that's my middle initial. I have always published. My byline is Sarvath S. Ahmed. So when I got married, 
I wasn't changing my name. It was going to be Sarvat S. Ahmad, um, which is my dad's last name. And that's a funny story, too, because it's not really his last name, because in Pakistan, not everyone really has to have a last name. Um, but when he came to America, his middle name became his last name, so that's our last name now. Wow. <laughs> so it's, it's really, it's, it's very different. Different cultures have different practices. But I decided that my professional name was Sarvat S. Ahmad, and it was going to stay that way. And I make sure my bylines also always say Sarvat S. Ahmad, not just Sarvat Ahmad. So I'm very particular about my, about my name. Um, anything else? Did, did we make sense at all? Well, did, I, I was confused about that. Mr. Hussein and the funny. I mean, I don't know why would that add a little. Oh, oh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, because my father's name is Hussein, and so my husband was called Mr. Hussein, even though he's Mr. Shah. So he's like, now I'm being called by your last name. That was, yeah, his. I think the reason for that is. Um, uh, she, like she said, her legal name is Hussein. That's her last name. My legal name is Ahmed. So when I go to the hospital with, to give birth to my children, the name on it is Ahmed. So my baby was baby Ahmed, not baby Arain, which is my son's, which are my son's last names. They, they have their dad's last names. So that's why she's talking about they used to call him Mr. Hussein rather than. The name Sabil is an Arabic word that means the way towards God or it's a path. In the context of Quran, it means the path towards God. You know, just like when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, sometimes I joke with my Christian friends that, you know, my name also means I am the way towards God, right? So Sabil is an Arabic word that means the path towards God, towards worshiping God. Go ahead, you can come. You can ask questions as well if you want to. Hi, I'm Michaela. I work at the library here. How important is it to marry within the faith? They want me to. <laughs> All right. Um, so here is the deal with uh, Islam or Muslims marrying within Islam or marrying outside of Islam. First, I will give you what Islam says, and then perhaps the logic behind it. Now, for the Muslim males, they, it is for them, they're encouraged to marry from the Muslim females, and there is a permission for them to marry from the chaste Christian ladies or from the Jewish ladies, because they're considered as people of the book. A revelation came to them also through Jesus and Moses. So there is, a, there is a permission for the Muslim males to marry either a Jewish or a Christian lady as long as they are chaste. But the first encouragement is to marry a Muslim lady. Now for the Muslim ladies, they only can marry a Muslim male. Right? What are you saying out there? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's only my first part of the answer. All right, just wait. Islam shoots for equity, not equality. Really important. So here is the wisdom behind it. Here is the wisdom behind it. Just like a country has to have a president, just like a school has to have a principal, a house has to have the head of the house. And just like in Christianity and, and in Judaism, the head of the household is the husband or the male, the father. Same thing with Islam, by the way. Yeah, you are the head of your house. That's what you think. I don't think he thinks. <laughs> All right, so really important, right? Coming back to the reason behind it. Now, if a Muslim male marries a Christian female, for example, we respect Christianity. Almost all the prophets of Christianity, Old Testament, New Testament, are also part of Islam. So we are going to respect her faith. She cannot be forced to convert to Islam. Really important. And anything that she is made to cook or to clean, along with the help of the husband, she doesn't have to do anything that is going to dilute her faith. The most important thing is, a Christian lady marrying to a Muslim man will not have her faith diluted. 
because we respect Christianity and Judaism equally because they are from the people of the book. Just change the scenario if a Muslim lady is marrying to a Christian man, for example. She may have her cooked pork. She may have her to go and buy alcohol, for example, or do gambling on her behalf, which is forbidden for the Muslim lady. She cannot even, she doesn't even have, she cannot do gambling herself. She cannot drink herself. Plus, she's not even supposed to go and buy any alcoholic beverage for anyone, including her husband. And now, if, she's, if he tells her, okay, you know, why don't you also come to church with me? As the head of the household, then she has to go. So at the end of the day, her faith is diluted when she marries other than a Muslim man. So for that reason, Islam allows for the Muslim male, encourage for them the very first choice is a Muslim lady. But if there is a need arises, a chaste Christian lady or a Jewish lady. But he cannot force her faith. He cannot force them to convert to Islam. On the other side, obviously, the faith of the Muslim lady would be diluted if she marries a Christian man or someone who is outside of Islam. All right, I hope you understand that. Yes. I would like to ask the three ladies, uh, you know you were talking about um, education for women. Uh, how do you how do you feel about countries that force um, Islamic ideas on women? For example, um, Iran after the revolution, we all if we were all living there, we all would have been dressed as uh, the lady in the middle, and they were forced, and it was you know women would be beaten or charged. What about in Saudi Arabia, where... Can, can, it, you, put, wait, no, I no, can, really, can you speak in okay. the mic, please? Yeah, because I, I just, they cannot hear in the back, okay. sorry. I just want the ladies to answer yes, this. Yes. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, I do. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, where women couldn't drive and do various uh, things, and then in, in other countries where young women were denied the right for schooling, based on maybe not your religion, but your the government's interpretation of that religion. How do you explain this? This has been going, I mean, women really had a rough time in Iran after the revolution. And in Saudi Arabia, you know, they're just coming into their own now after how long? How do you how do you feel about it, and how do you explain it? And I I want to just hear from ladies. I, I don't I don't want to hear from a man. I want to hear from women who maybe you know you know people who who have experienced these things. Well, I appreciate that you want to hear from us. Um, we love that people want to hear our women's voices. Um, I believe that it's also important to have Muslim and non-Muslim male allies as well. So it's good to hear their opinions as well. Um, what you said, uh, Brother Sabil actually had mentioned this before. We talked about cultural bias as opposed to Islam. So that's my answer right there. This is. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, I thought I was loud enough as it is, as my husband says. But, <laughs> but um, so those countries where they're forcing people to believe a certain thing or to dress a certain way, in Quran it says there's no compulsion in religion, and we understand that. Um, it's not right for them to be doing that. Uh, we don't really consider any country in America, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the world, regardless of whether they call themselves Islamic Republic of Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or, the, or whatever it is, I don't see one country in the world that really follows Islamic uh, example um, that can really be called an Islamic government because they're a mix of a lot of things, right? Um, so my answer would be education. The women have to be educated, they have to rise up, and they are in their own ways. Um, women in Saudi Arabia would go out driving. They'd get arrested, but they would do it anyway. Um, women in, so in uh, Iran, they would go out, some would unveil, some, and, or even just participating, even if you are, there are women who want to be veiled in Iran and in Saudi Arabia, in America, in Pakistan. But that doesn't stop them from going out and asking for other rights that they're not getting, right? They'll go out there, they'll demonstrate the women who are educated will advocate for women who are not educated or women who don't know how to advocate for themselves. So it's happening. But like we said, 
education and of course with the internet, the social media, education is becoming more widespread. Of course there's always misconceptions that are spread on social media as well, but these are all tools that we're all using to kind of get those ideas out there of what is accepted in Islam and what is unaccepted and what is unacceptable to us. And, but you know, you are all educated women. And like in places like Afghanistan where that young girl, I, I, I think she won a Nobel Prize. Malala. Uh, you know, was burned for, it, these countries are, uh, they have what, hundreds or thousands of little villages where, you know, educated people are not in abundance. And, you know, aren't you talking about educating uh, a different kind of education? I mean, I, I don't see this sweeping some of these countries where they're, they're, they're so rural and isolated. Do you want to answer that? Um, Actually, over there, especially in you know Pakistan and India, um, where there is less of an education for women, they don't even have food and water to drink. So their basic necessities are not even mm -hmm. being met. They don't have homes. They don't have clean water. Yeah, I understand. So that. so much of the country's resources are going there. Plus, just today when I was on Facebook, there are so many uh, entrepreneurs constantly saying, let's connect, collect money from, the, from us living here and, and uh, donate to schools. There were, you know, constantly there are schools and colleges for Muslim girls and just girls in general in these countries. Definitely there's a huge lack of it. Uh, and then in the Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries, I lived there for 16 years we would love to be one of them. They are so, they are literally, each of them live like princesses. Even just average women, yes, they are wearing, you know, full black in front of you. When they go to their homes, they have beautiful homes. When they go to parties, you should see their parties, their food. I mean, yes, the, the kind of, um, we get this, um, a portrayal that, oh, poor women, they're always dressed in black, but the lifestyle they leave, lead over there is amazing. I would love to be one of them. I mean, yes, you know, driving, okay, you know, I want to drive, but they're driven. I would love to be driven around everywhere. So again, it's that I concept like it of... I would to be my choice, though. Sure, sure, I completely yeah. understand. And But Saudi Arabia is the only Muslim country that women are not allowed to drive. Plus, we have so many Muslim countries that have had women presidents and prime ministers. I, I for, for, in, you know, for hundreds of years, we've had so many Muslim countries that have presidents and prime ministers that have been women. Can so, women vote in Saudi Arabia? I think uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, that's yes. Most, yeah. They do have. The well, again, Saudi Arabia government and Arab government, they're all like kings, and, and so there is no real voting as such. Yeah, so, you know, there's no elections or anything. They're, they're all kings and queens and princess. And so it's all generational. Uh, um, so, she, you know. Level, I think yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. about Iran and other uh, uh, you know. Yeah, to, to yeah, vote, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not questioning that in Iran. I'm just questioning, you know, I was just questioning how, what does one do when a country enforces the ideas of a religion? Uh, and, and maybe, you know, it's, maybe I, I don't want to follow all the strictness. Absolutely. That is true. I mean, you've made this choice, and in our country you can make this yes. choice. That is true. Um, I, I personally, I also feel that, um, I feel it's a very small, I mean, small percentage. Sometimes I feel that even, I'm from Pakistan, so there would be a scenario, a specific case of a woman who is subjugated or who's, you know, something really bad happened to her. And then that portrays to the whole world about Islam or a Muslim woman. And in media, it is portrayed as if, you know, oh my God, I mean, in Islamic country, such a horrible thing happened to a Muslim woman. I mean, it's a very small percentage, but I feel the way it's portrayed, mm -hmm. the, way, the way it is told to the whole world, sometimes there's a problem in that. And as, as she said, I mean, the good news is that in Saudi Arabia, women can drive now. <laughs> Finally, they, uh, they got the permission. How to drive, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm also among those that I always ask my husband, please drive me anywhere. I hate to drive. So it's, it's, uh, as you said, that it's our choice. If you want to, I mean, we should be. But I think the word oppression, the word being oppressed, 
being oppressed. We, we say that Muslim women are oppressed in the Islamic countries. I feel the definition of uh, being oppressed is that um, a forceful control on someone. But then when I look at the European countries where the niqab was banned. But I'm right now, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm saying just, just interested in, in yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just saying, I'm just my personal, I mean, answer. You can agree or disagree with me, but I'm just saying that this is it's in different form in the world, right? And somebody's saying put it on to a Muslim woman, and somebody's saying take it off. Yeah. So that both are wrong, right? I mean, we should be raising our voice that any woman, not only Muslim women, they should be free to say, to do, to live a life the way they want. Of course, they have to follow the gold standard, which is Quran, which is the guidance from God, any woman from any faith. That, that, and that's the way we could live a, a, you know, a life full of harmony and peace and happiness in this, on this earth. That's our belief. But then again, I, I would say that whoever is oppressing of, a Muslim, of any woman or Muslim women in, in particular, they are doing it wrong. I mean, and now I've been hearing a news that now they are starting again a campaign to, for the Muslim women to take off their, in France, um, to take off their headscarf. They are, not, they are planning to uh, pass a bill that Muslim women should not be wearing the headscarf when they are outside in the public, which is wrong. I mean, I've really, the way you are feeling bad for, for those Islamic countries, I really feel bad for the women in France and European countries. So, I mean, both are, I mean, we should be raising our voice to end this oppression. And definitely there is no force in faith. So you're right when you say that, you know, the government forces all the women to do certain things. That is not Islam. You cannot force. But then the, the Muslim women and their spouses then, or brothers or fathers, then have to make that. But then what happens is because the family itself might not be a practicing family, the, the father or the husband itself, himself does not understand the Quran or following the Quran, that family is, you know, the, 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 the wife or the kids are not living that life of a Muslim family, and then that community is not, that country is not, so unfortunately it kind of uh, goes from there. Um, and I completely lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. Just one small thing, uh, by the time you remember, that in Afghanistan, Afghanistan in particular, I feel the, the political unrest and the situation is so, it's, it's, I mean, worst is a light word to use for it. I mean, as she said that the basic needs of a woman or in general any human being is not given by the government. So I feel that, I mean, the, the whole, we have to look at the big picture. I mean, what is contributing to that situation where we feel that a Muslim woman is so much subjugated or so much of, you know, forced to do certain things, which the world doesn't like. And we shouldn't like, we shouldn't be liking it. We should be, we should be raising our voice. But then I feel that when we look at the whole situation, then we kind of find the clue that from where it is coming. Right. True. And again, you know, my relatives that live in Pakistan, their problems are, uh, oh, we don't know what to tell the maid to cook today. Really? And, and so that is the reality there, too, of certain classes. And there are, of course, groups, uh, you know, that are um, uh, not educated. But, you know, again, our, the, the, the middle class families are trying their best to give them money to make sure that their maids' children go, do go to school. And so a lot is being done, but a lot doesn't come out in the media. No, thank you for asking. Should I say something? <laughs> I'll take your vote. Go ahead. Say something. Say something, okay. You have my permission. Thank you. All right. No, just to add to it, having a dress code in an Islamic country is a good thing. In the library, there is a dress code, right? A person just cannot come here naked. True? Right. There is a dress code when we go to schools and colleges. There is a dress code when we go to work. So there is a reason, wisdom behind any dress code. So if any Muslim country enforcing a modesty dress code, it is good for the society. And obviously, as you mentioned, nobody can force a faith on any other person because the Quran is totally against forcing of the faith. It says in chapter 2 of the Quran, verse number 256, La ikhraha There is no compulsion in faith. So if any person, doesn't matter a dictator or a president or a parent forcing the faith, that's wrong. Islam has given the choice. But the dress code 
if a country is saying or a job or a school is saying they dress certain way it is good it is for the productive of the of the country the students and for the employee so that's important because sometimes you may look at it and say you know they are dressed certain way they are forced to do that way but they may feel comfortable that way who knows as this ladies the, the wonderful ladies are saying over here they are more comfortable in a muslim country dressing this way and those ladies they may pity us that you know how come the people over here they are objectified and the hollywood is giving them this pressure they should dress certain way they should have certain makeup buy certain uh, brand name clothes so the freedom where is the fr the pressure is over here but for the sisters they don't have to follow any of the pressures they're following the creator and that is freedom in islam that is freedom i hope you feel that way absolutely Thank you. Let me say one more thing. Talking about how it's hard for the women who are being forced to wear it, right? Um, and I want to talk about another thing, right? Um, we're women here living in a democratic society, and we've chosen to wear it and to follow our religion the way that we feel that our religion should be followed. And what I wanted to say is, here, it's hard to put it on in this country, right? It's not an easy. I mean, people look at what we were talking about, this idea you said, oh, these poor women, they're oppressed, they're being forced to work. A lot of those women are not being forced to work. Some are. We don't want them to be. A lot of them are not. Here, I mean, this idea of women being um, coerced and controlled, it says women are weak, right? But in societies where we are, France, she was talking about, here in America, to put on that hijab is a very hard choice. My parents wanted me to do it for a long time, but it was my choice. I didn't do it for a very long time. But to put it on, it's not easy. Um, we live in a society where there's a certain ideal of beauty, of women's beauty, and I think we all understand what that is. The magazines say it. Right now, people think the first lady is the best first lady ever because she fits that ideal of beauty, right? Um, some people, you know, the ones who voted for that president, right? Um, the, the movies say it. TV screens tell us what women should be wearing. How, which one was prettier, which dress was nicer than the other dress. It's not easy for us who see all these beautiful hair commercials to, you know, we want to be pretty, everyone wants to be pretty. It's not easy, to, it takes a lot of strength and it takes a lot of commitment to your principle to make that choice to put it on. Just as, that's just as hard as being forced to put it on, uh, it's, just as, it's just as hard to decide to put it on in a society where they're telling you that's not normal. Why are you doing that? And where are you being questioned when it's my choice to decide what is beautiful and appropriate attire for me as a Muslim woman, what I want to wear? And that was the point that I wanted to make. That's it. Peace and blessings to everybody here. Um, I just had a question. I guess this doesn't really follow protocol because I'm asking a question to the audience and I guess maybe the non-Muslim friends. How did you feel when you read that poem that was posted um, with the Confederate flag regarding hijab? Did you feel like it was a satire poem? Did you feel like it was posed in any way as funny? or The poem that kind of brought us all here today. Um, I don't have the poem with me. Not everyone knows that. Oh, not everybody knows that. Maybe you could describe it. Um, Actually, I do have the poem. Okay. If you don't mind. So, so my question pretty much was just, how did you guys feel when you saw that? Because it kind of sparked. They didn't see it. So I guess when you hear it or you yeah. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just. Uh, I'm you. trying to see where. Why didn't you? Then? I saw it after the controversy, kind of. I had to go back and look for it, and it, did everybody hear my first part? Uh, I, I heard about the controversy, so I had to go mm -hmm. dig up what it actually looked for, and then I had to like blow up that thing so I could read it. And, um, it made no sense to me. I mean, I was an English major. I studied a lot of literature. I know what poetry is and a little bit about art, but I didn't get the point. It wasn't, it wasn't, if that's what it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be satire, I felt it was not successful as satire. Um, I wasn't sure what it was, really. Um, I, I, and it, it just was, to me it was just bizarre. It didn't, it, 
it just fell flat as satire and didn't do anything else for me. I mean, other than being offensive. So, anybody else who has seen it? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. It's yeah. I mean, I have, a, I have an instant negative reaction when I see a Confederate flag anyway, so I wasn't predisposed to give it a lot of thought, but... You know, we have to really applaud the library for taking it down. Give them a big hand, by the way. It's really good. Yes. Yeah, it, it took some time. One time before the library took it down. I'm sorry, that does not make applause. But at least they took it down, and hopefully it's a good lesson for all of us. It's a good lesson for the, all the libraries that hate speech is not accepted. Not for Muslims, not for Jews, not for minorities, and not for anyone, hate speech cannot be accepted. So that's a very important lesson for us. Okay. Secondly, just to be on the record. Just want to add what you just said. When you said about hate, hate speech, I'll just speak loudly. Hate speech is not, that's an Islamic principle. Mm -hmm. Our prophet was an anti-racist. Um, just, uh, that's just what I want to say. What he's sure, sure. saying, it's not just he's saying it because we're Americans living here and we all believe that hate speech is not unacceptable. This is an Islamic principle. Any kind of hate speech, whether it's against Jews or, or blacks or Muslims or women or, or you know transgender people, any, any kind of hate speech that chooses to hurt somebody and chooses to hurt them, which may lead to violence, this is anti-Islamic. This is, it's anti-human, the way we believe it. You know, it's really important for us to know that even before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before he was given the revelation as a youth, a really important incident happened in the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. That one of the merchants who was a minority, he came from outside of Arabia in Mecca and he was selling some goods. Somebody purchased the goods but refused to give him the money for the goods. And he raised the voice and nobody was coming to help. So what Muhammad, peace be upon him, what he did was to look out for the rights of the minorities and those people who are oppressed, he formed an alliance, the alliance of the righteous. And that alliance of the righteous, they made a commitment that from this point on, we are going to be the voice for the oppressed. We will look out for the people who are minorities of different tribes whose rights are taken away. So it's not an American principle, it's a universal principle, and definitely it's an Islamic principle. So we hope and pray that, uh, and also just to be on the record, by the way, just to be on the record, we invited Dr. George Miller to this forum today. The same person who wrote that, we invited him. There was a back and forth correspondence. Initially he accepted to come and give a short speech, what not, his take, but then later on he declined. And hopefully we want to sit down with him. He's a human being. Human beings make, make mistakes. Doesn't matter, big mistakes, small mistakes. We want to sit down with him. We want to show him that Islam stands for peace and justice. That hijab is a symbol of empowerment and strength and morality for the Muslim ladies. We want to sit down and educate, since education is what we are saying. Who knows, and once we educate them, the true concept of modesty and hijab, inshallah, as we say, God willing, he can take the turn for the positive. He can write a poem that is going to be empowering, inshallah, for the Muslim ladies. Right? So hopefully, down the line, we want to go and educate our brother, George Miller, inshallah. So he's the one that wrote the poem? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he's a professor at the Lewis University, by the way. Any more questions? You said you had one more? Or? Good. That's all right. <laughs> all right, any one of the panelists, would you like to have a, your concluding remarks? Oh, you know what, uh, just, just a, a, a very, very quick uh, life story. Um, I was born in Pakistan. Uh, my father found a job in Dubai. Uh, we moved as a family to Dubai uh, when I was six years old. And... Um, we lived 16 years there. I did all my schooling there. My father was very big on education for girls and boys. And I was the older sister. I had a younger brother. We went to a Catholic convent 
in Dubai. So again, Muslim country, Muslim uh, family going to a Catholic convent because of the educational value of it. Um, I had friends from all over the world speaking different languages because it was a very cosmopolitan uh, city, Dubai at that time as well. Um, but then uh, speaking different languages because it was a Catholic convent, I used to go to church with them every morning, stand at the door while they went in and worshiped. So again, in Dubai, we grew up so, you know, so exposed to different cultures, different languages, different faiths. Um, and now us friends are all connected on Facebook again after so many years because of such fond memories with each other. Um, in, in Dubai at that time, in the 70s and the 80s, they showed a lot of American TV. So in Dubai, I grew up watching Knott's Landing, Dallas, Falcon Crest, 30-something, 21 Jump Street, Beverly Hills 90210. I used to listen to um, American songs. You know, George Michael and Wham was my number one at that time as a teenager in school. And so, and when actually I, I came to America, and I was American at heart when I was living in Dubai. I wanted to come to America and, and make a life over here. So when I came here and I started my, my teaching career, got married, and I was, you know, kind of, when our first son was born, that's when I realized, like, ooh, I don't really know too much about my faith. You know, how am I going to teach my child? That's when 20 years back is when I started studying Islam and I called myself born again Muslim. Um, and that's when I came out of my me, myself, and I bubble into, wow, Islam tells me to go out and make this world a better place. I'm not supposed to be selfish. I'm supposed to be sharing. So actually, my religion empowered me into being a better mother, a better wife, a better daughter, a better teacher. Um, that, you know, I was doing it for God and having that satisfaction. And then 9-11 happened, and, and that's when everybody's saying, oh, Islam is such a you know, evil religion. And I said, no, I've been studying it. And that's when I realized lack of education. And that's when 20 years back, 15 years back, 18 years back, it became my passion that, no, I am going to bring hearts closer together as much as I can. And Islam gave me that strength. Islam gave me that vision, that goal, um, that purpose in life. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly what it was that I read on the internet. But um, it was an article. Uh, yeah, it was it was something about how we can support and aid, in particular, a Muslim woman, a Muslim woman who's being harassed in public. Um, in your opinion, what can what should any of us do if we see somebody in public harassing a Muslim yeah, that, woman? That show called "What Would You Do." <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, it's such a, such a beautiful question. I mean, just you asking it, and we, we are so we are so thankful to you for asking this question. Believe me or not. But um, first, maybe answering, um, you know, concluding uh, brother Sabil asked for the concluding remarks that I, I really, and then I'll answer your question. Um, that I really love this country uh, to my heart. The reason I came here. Um, to was to basically, my family was here, my extended family, my mother's uh, family was here, my grandma, my aunt. But the main reason I came here when I was 16 years old in 1996 was to enjoy the freedom, mm -hmm. to enjoy this blessing of freedom and to live a life, of, of, you know, a life which is full of, you know, what you can do whatever you want to do in a positive way, not in a negative way. And then I even and believe, and just imagine in 96 when it was not the Muslim community or Muslim women were not that, commonly wearing this, you know, this niqab, which is called the face covering. And even at that time, until now, until a few years back, I used to, I used to see more positive, you know, expressions on faces, smiling, even though it's so, something so new to most of the people, most of the Americans. But I would say I love this country. I, I, feel, I proudly, I say that I'm a very proud American Muslim woman. And um, I, I just only request, and that was my request before you say the question that, we have to stand up for justice. We have to stand up for um, you know, giving opportunities to everyone, to each and every person on, on, living in this, in this country. And then I would say just stand up to speak about something. I mean, whenever we see something happening wrong or some injustice going on, I think the, the, the most powerful thing which I can do is that stand up and say, this is wrong. I mean, just saying it and acknowledging it in front of 
in the public because that's the that's the biggest threat. Now it's becoming a threat uh, in living in this country that people are quiet. They don't want to talk about anything which is going on wrong. They think that it's not my problem, it's someone else's problem. So I took my I took my kids and my husband and I decided to go to the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, which happened two years back in downtown. And my kids asked, why do we need to go to Black Lives Matter? It's there. I mean, it's not a Muslim issue. It's not a, so, I mean, the kids think like that, that it's not us. Why, why do we need to care? And then I said that if we are not going to care about others today, no one is going to care for us tomorrow. So I think just getting up and speaking up for somebody, that's the biggest help you can do. For, for anyone, not just for Muslim women, but for anyone. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming here. And I mean, just for, yeah, just for um, uh, being a Muslim woman, I'm, I feel so thankful to my husband who's sitting here. I mean, when I got married when I was 20, and then I have five kids within like seven years. And then I was, my education was discontinued when I came here. And then he was the one who pushed me. He said, you have to go and study. And I was like, no, please, I'm done with my studies back home. I did my bachelor's. I don't want to study anymore. But he said, education is power. Go out and study. So, I mean, I would say go and travel. Go and look, uh, travel and visit Islamic countries. You would see a totally different picture um, compared to what we are hearing and listening and looking at in the media. So I would definitely say that. And thank you so much for coming here. OK, so. Um, I have a few things to say about your answer, but I wanted to kind of piggyback on what she was saying, and she was talking about the Black Matters Lives rally and what's something her son, I want to clarify, Black Lives Matter is very much a Muslim issue. We have a very large African-American Muslim community in this country. They came over, they were forced over as slaves. That's how long back it goes. Um, so that is very much a Muslim community, and as I said before, anti-racism is very Islamic. This is a very Islamic perspective. Um, as to answering your question, um, thank you so much for asking that. I think it's a beautiful question and the fact that you even want to do something, the intention is to be applauded. First thing I would say is please be safe. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say to anybody. Look at your situation, make sure it's a safe situation for you. If you remember what happened in Seattle, the two men who had stood up for um, the Muslim women on, on the bus, I believe, and they were stabbed and they were killed, and I can only imagine the burden of, that is on the minds of those sisters that were there. Second is that, um, please, please don't ask, what do I do for Muslim women? I think it's for anybody who is being harassed or um, for, their, for being a woman or for being a, a black person or if you've seen the latest, uh, what happened in New York City, the, Latino, uh, the Latina women who were um, by, that, by that lawyer who, who were told to get out of the country. It's funny, you were talking about social media. My friend and I, she's a Sikh American, I'm a Muslim American. She's an old friend of mine from New York. And we both said, hey, if we'd been there, we would have been on him so fast, you know, uh, because no kind of bigotry is acceptable, none of it. Um, the most important thing that I think, though, is go back into your communities, into your families, into your friends, and tell them to become educated. That's really, we want to stop that from happening, not only be there to speak against it when it's happening, we just don't want that to be happening, right? So we want them to be educated in terms of, who are Muslims? I don't want to have to do any more of these women in Islam <laughs> lectures uh, because I don't want to be judged by this and have to explain this all the time. I want to be judged by my character. I wished you had. But um, yeah, inshallah, God willing. Um, but uh, what I really think is important is you go back and you talk in your in your in, on your thing over Thanksgiving dinner, or Christmas dinner, or whatever, and say just have an open discussion. You know, maybe we need to learn a little bit more about black Americans and what they went through. Maybe we need to learn a little bit more about what Jews are going through. Maybe we need to learn a little bit more about what Muslim uh, men, women, everyone are going through. And maybe once we educate ourselves, then those incidents will stop happening. And, and that's just everything else that they said, that's, that's perfect. I just wanted to add that a little bit. Thank you. So let's con conclude just two quick points just to summarize and then one short story. The really first important point, I hope this is a take home lesson for all of us, is not to judge Islam and women in Islam by some cultural practices. Really important. So the onus is on for all of us, by the way. 
Just like we need to educate our own people, all of you have to also educate about what Islam is, who Muslims are. Visit your Muslim neighbors. Pick up a copy of the Quran, the Islamic literature which is out there. And you will find out that how Islam has empowered our Muslim ladies. And last but not the least, uh, we had a similar lecture at the Glendale Heights Public Library. And in the Q&A session, there was one lady, she raised her hand and she said, you know, when we speak about all this women in Islam topic, how they are subjugated, she said, I converted to Islam two weeks ago. And she's a white Caucasian lady, she's saying, the reason I converted to Islam is because I found the peace in Islam. And she started to wear the hijab, and she's saying that do not judge Islam by what you see up there. I am a representative of, I am a representative of Islam. So it's important for us that, you know, in this country, I mean, you'll be amazed to find out close to 25,000 of our fellow Americans, after they read the Quran, out of their own choice, they are embracing Islam. No one, no one is forcing them. And 60% of the lady, 60% of the people who are converting or reverting to Islam, they are ladies. So despite all the misconceptions, all the negative coverage in the media, when a person actually knows what Islam stands for, how it stands for the rights, not just of the Muslim women, for all the people, the guidance it brings, the salvation it provides for all of us. People by their own choice, they are converting to Islam. So it is your right, it is my right, it's everyone's right, is to look into each other's background, our guidance that God has given to us, and educate especially about Islam because there are more misconceptions about Islam. So I hope and pray that all of you make use of the literature which is out there. Take a copy of the Quran. Call us at the telephone number. We have a phone number, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Or go to the gainpeace.com website. And inshallah, God willing, as, as we would say, you will find that Islam stands for justice, peace, equality, and success for all of humanity. With that, again, thanks all of you for coming over here. May God guide us and may God bless us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabeel, and our sisters here. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And also want to thank the Centuri Public Library and Michaela for allowing us to do this here. Uh, the microphone is working or no? I don't know. Uh, we will have another session later on regarding Sharia law, maybe in a few months' time over here as well. So is it permissible? Can we do that again or no? We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to put you in the spot. All right, so uh, thank you so much. And I would request our uh, uh, brothers and sisters from other faith if you can stay back a little bit and give us a video testimony of what you thought about this program today. That will be helpful to us. Thank you so much. Okay.